My check, Monty.
Are you good to go? Okay. Can everyone please find a seat? We'll start the program momentarily. So April 26th, we've had four programs. Close to over, over that. Yeah. 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 Okay. If everyone can please find a seat, we'll start in just a moment. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, I'm John Miko, the Executive Director of the Union League Legacy Foundation, the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. I'm so thrilled that you're all here for this wonderful library hour. We are uh, just in the middle of the busiest, most wonderful time of the year, if you're into Legacy Foundation. We have, this is the fourth um, lecture we've had in about four weeks. Over a thousand people have been to those four lectures. We have granted almost $400,000 in scholarship aid to deserving young good citizens. Yes, you can clap for that, Carrie. Yes. <laughs> and children of, of Union League uh, employees. Uh, we had a uh, good citizen day in person again, where over 200 students learned about the constitution and civics, received the good citizenship um, award. So this is really a wonderful uh, time. Next week, we will have our scholarship ceremony. Very much looking forward to that. We're going to take a break uh, from lectures just for a couple of weeks. And our next one will be on June 8th. 
with Greg Lukianoff. Greg is the uh, president and CEO of FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. I hope you'll be there. It'll be a wonderful uh, Liberty Series uh, program. All that we do is made possible through voluntary contributions from you. So please, uh, we've never had the support we've had before. We need more so we can do more. Please uh, continue to be generous, and we thank you for your support. Um, so a couple housekeeping items, please, as always, uh, silence your cell phone or better off, just turn it off. Um, we are on Zoom, so uh, we will have a Q&A. Please use the microphone when we get to the Q&A because we need to hear that. Um, and as always, please keep your uh, questions short. Um, this one will be actually in the microphone. If we fail tonight, we're gonna have to go back to the cards. That's just the way it is. So let's keep the, the questions uh, short. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to tonight's program. And to introduce the program this evening uh, is our, the historian of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. Jim Mundy. Jim. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just a, one more bit of housekeeping. Did any did anybody lose a purse or a pocketbook? And you got it back. Okay. Thank you. All right. That's the night. The night is saved. Okay. Good. We're in good shape then. Okay. All right. So, all right, uh, pop quiz. Does anybody know what a tapophile is? One person, I, but you're a ringer, so that's okay. <laughs> Carrie's a ringer. All right, seriously, nobody, all oh, right. Oh, no kidding. Good, you, you learned a new word tonight. T-A-P-O-P-H-I-L-E, is our speaker is a tapophile. Not only is he a tapophile, all right, can you go around going? He actually works at a cemetery. So tapophile is someone who simply likes and studies cemeteries and cemetery history. And our speaker this evening, after he abandoned his career of 33 years as a defense or a criminal lawyer in New York City, that's a long time, uh, in 2007, transformed himself into the historian for the Greenwood Cemetery, which is one of the greatest cemeteries in the country. It is monstrous. If you've never been there, I'd encourage you to go there. Uh, it's in Brooklyn, obviously. And it is a spectacular place to see. Uh, so to me, that's my interest in our speaker this evening. But of course, I also like bridges. And if I'm not mistaken, part of the Brooklyn Bridge was manufactured in Philadelphia. I think some of the cabling, perhaps. But maybe we'll find out. Ah, it's okay. I got, I, got, I got one of these. So maybe, all right. You know, I'm always trying to push Philly. So what the heck? So, but our speaker, though, uh, was a lawyer by profession, uh, shifted in 2007, then became, uh, and Greenwood, I mean, he does Civil War history, World War I, World War II. He does mapping at the, at, at the cemetery. He does cemetery exhibits. Uh, three in the Civil War, one in Coney Island, if I remember correctly, and then he fell in love. But, but he's also, above everything else, a New Yorker. And New Yorkers, like Philadelphians, I hope, love New York, just like we love Philadelphia. So, uh, and of course, you can't love New York and not love the Brooklyn Bridge. And so clearly, uh, his collection of stereo views and photographs and things like that of the Brooklyn Bridge is what really prompted him to create the book on the bridge tonight. And he was actually there in 1983 for the centennial celebration. Yep, I got the date right. Okay. For the centennial of, uh, of the Brooklyn Bridge itself. So I think we're in for a really fun night tonight, all the way around. So it is with great pleasure I introduce you to our speaker, Mr. Jeffrey Richman. Thank you. So I am uh, truly honored to be here this evening. I am a student of the Civil War. Uh, it was mentioned that I have worked on World War I and World War II veterans at Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, now for 20 years, we've been looking for Civil War veterans at Greenwood. And uh, I was young and foolish back in 2002 when we started this and thought that we might find 500 Civil War veterans. And we have gone well past 5,000 that we have identified and written biographies for each of them, gotten Department of Veterans Affairs gravestones for over 2,000 of them who were in unmarked graves. And so it has been a journey. And of course, also Greenwood being in Brooklyn is rich in the history of the Brooklyn Bridge. And so many of the trustees of the bridge are there. The general superintendent is there. Three of the six assistant uh, engineers are there. 
And I have been a collector for as long as I can remember, starting with uh, baseball cards and building from there. And I have collected stereo views of New York City, which of course included bridge, uh, views of the Brooklyn Bridge as it was being built, uh, invitations to the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge, lantern slides of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, woodcuts of the Brooklyn Bridge. And this book sort of fortuitously came together uh, as collectors would do. I actually went to a memorial service for a collector friend of mine and his widow took the time out from the memorial service to introduce me to another collector who had to outbid me on 25 views of the Brooklyn Bridge being built. And that sort of launched this book. And so uh, I was kind of there fortuitously, uh, knew another collector who had a spectacular collection. And so what we're going to see is this joining of the images from municipal archives in New York City, the original drawings that they found under the bridge about 30 or 40 years ago that nobody knew were there collecting dust uh, that were saved. Uh, the Museum of the City of New York and their images and RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, from which Washington Roebling, who built the bridge, graduated. So here is the title of the bridge, Building the Brooklyn Bridge, 1869 to 1883, an illustrated history with images in 3D. The cover of the bridge. And so let's get oriented for those of you uh, familiar or not familiar with New York City, we are looking at a bird's eye view of New York. And so here we have New Jersey, the Hudson River, Manhattan, the Brooklyn Bridge opened in 1883, and Brooklyn. And what's key here in terms of understanding why a bridge, why was the bridge needed, is this green space out here. And so this is the western tip of Long Island. Long Island, uh, I've lived on it most of my life. It stretches over 100 miles out. Uh, it's currently occupied by millions of people. But the key here was that you needed living space for people. And so by the 1860s, the largest city in all of America was New York City, which was primarily Manhattan. The second largest was Philadelphia. <laughs> and the third largest was the city of Brooklyn, which was a separate entity. In 1898, Brooklyn became a borough. It is still referred to in Brooklyn as the great mistake. And so what you had here crucially in the 1860s, Manhattan was considered full. They didn't have the concept of steel cages. They were gonna build up. And so there was no place for people to live. And so if you replace the ferries that were running back and forth here and were unreliable, particularly in the winter when the East River froze with a suspension bridge that offered reliable transportation, then it would be a whole new ball game and people could start to occupy these green spaces out here. So Brooklyn is four times the size in the acreage of Manhattan. And so people could live in Brooklyn. By 1930, there were more people in Brooklyn than there were in Manhattan. And so you could live here, you could commute to Manhattan, which was the economic power, and it worked for everyone. And so the bridge opens in 1883, as I said, by 1889, this is a coin that is issued in honor of George Washington's inauguration, 1789 to 1889. And what goes on the back of the coin? The eighth wonder of the world. This is a bridge that is only six years old at the time, and yet it's already being hailed as this great wonder. Uh, it, all sorts of advertisers wanted to be associated with it. This is Willimantic spool cotton. And so you see, fortunately, this is not the case, but these spools up in here and spools made out of cables. And the masterwork on the bridge and the book I love very much is David McCullough's The Great Bridge, which came out 50 years ago. It's just a wonderful description of the many aspects of the bridge. 
but I thought that I could kind of help our understanding with all of the images. So there are 252 images in this book, which tell the story of the bridge. So here's John A. Roebling who planned the bridge and more on him in a moment. And this is his son, Washington Roebling, who actually built the bridge. And this is Emily Roebling, wife of Washington Roebling, who actually played a crucial role in the building of the bridge. So here's the book, here is the table of contents. And you can see, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that Richard Haw here is, uh, wrote an introduction. Richard wrote the biography of John Roebling, the father. And Erica Wagner, the Brooklyn Bridge, a love story. Erica wrote the biography of Washington Roebling. And both of them agreed to write introductions to the book. And then we kind of tracked through the engineers, the workers, and then the various stages of the construction of the bridge through the opening day, May 24th of 1883. And so here we go through the chapters, the engineers. So again, John Roebling and Washington Roebling, father and son, the chief engineers, John A. Roebling, chief engineer, trained in Germany, Mulhausen, Germany, as an engineer, studied philosophy with Hegel. By one account, he was Hegel's favorite student, uh, fled Germany to become a Pennsylvania farmer and went in ultimately into wire rope manufacturing and became the leading suspension bridge builder in the world. And so he was not, as you might guess uh, from this photograph of him, known for his sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> he was more known for the fierceness of his personality, for not taking a day off. I don't think vacation was part of his vocabulary, but he was really a genius in terms of pioneering the idea of suspension bridges. There were other suspension bridges. Every one of them had a bridge collapse. He never collapsed a bridge. And so this is an image that I specifically added for this presentation. He comes, he flees Germany. He decides Germany is not for him. The bureaucracy is too much. He can't get anything done. He pretty much secretly flees because the Germans would not have been happy that someone had a training in engineering and was leaving the country. So he organizes a group of 20 or so people and they come to America and he and his older brother buy acreage north of Pittsburgh. And they found the town which becomes Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. And so this is the Butler County Museum, uh, I believe is in this building over on the side here. Uh, Saxonburg currently has a population of 1400 people. And so you may not have been there, but uh, they have this model of the Brooklyn Bridge as their claim to fame. So he establishes himself as a farmer, having never spent a day in his life farming. And after a year or so, he decides that his wife will be the farmer and he's gonna make wire rope. He had read it in an, a European journal about wire rope replacing hemp. And so he goes into the business and his sons become multimillionaires. Washington Roebling, when he dies, leaves a fortune of over close to $30 million in 1926, which today would be real money. Uh, so here's Washington Roebling, the son. He is a graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. He's an experienced bridge builder by the time the Brooklyn Bridge comes around because he takes his summers, he doesn't go off on vacation. He goes and helps his father build suspension bridges. Uh, he was a Civil War veteran early in the Civil War. His father says to him, I think your feet have sat underneath my table long enough. Go enlist. And he enlists the next day, April of 1861. And he works his way up from private to lieutenant colonel. His best buddy is uh, Emily Warren Roebling's brother, Governor Warren, Governor Kemble Warren who becomes the hero of Gettysburg and Little Round Top. And Washington Roebling is as much the hero of Little Round Top as Governor Warren. 
And he's 32 years old when he takes over the construction of the bridge simply because his father gets himself killed by the ferry. In the irony of all ironies, they go down to the uh, area where they're going to put the bridge and they're surveying. And his father is at the ferry slip and gets his leg crushed. And so here is Emily Roebling. She uh, did not have a formal training, but had a bent for science and mathematics. There was no place that a woman could go to become an engineer in this era. But when Washington Roebling was debilitated as a result of what they called Quezon's disease, which was the bends working on the bridge, and also from basically a nervous breakdown, he had exhausted himself, thrown so much of his energy into the construction of the bridge that he just could not bear conversation. He could not bear any kind of light. And so his wife became the liaison to the staff. The bridge was built over a 14 year period and not once did Washington Roebling walk on the bridge during those entire 14 years. Yet he supervised the construction of the bridge by letter. He and Emily spent two years in Trenton. So it's actually Trenton where the, uh, well, where the Roeblings had their primary wire manufacturing business. She uh, was widely admired by the assistant engineers and the staff. She led the first delegation that walked across the bridge. And then she rode across the bridge with a rooster on her hand as a symbol of triumph. So this was at her husband's insistence. So crossing the East River, there had long been a desire to get across. Farmers on Long Island wanted to get their produce to market. And so here we are. This is actually where George Washington escaped after the Battle of Brooklyn. Uh, I was at the uh, museum, uh, American Museum of the Revolution today. And for whatever reason, they call the battle the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, which I object strongly to. There was no fighting in Brooklyn Heights during that battle. In fact, there was fighting across Greenwood Cemetery. And that was the focus. And that was actually the biggest battle of the entire American Revolution. The first battle just weeks after the Declaration of Independence. And some 60,000 soldiers gathered on or about the field. So really a consequential battle. But if you want to go across the East River, which is actually not a river, it's a tidal estuary. And so that's part of the challenge of building across here. But there were ferries that went across. And so here's an early ferry, horse powered, which is where the phrase comes from. They put a horse on a treadmill and the horse would power the steam, uh, the before steamboat, the ferry across. But the problem, of course, was freezing. And so before we had climate change, the East River would freeze in the winter. People had to get to work. The ferries weren't running. They would start to walk across. The ice would start to break up and it was not a good situation for anyone. And so the solution was a suspension bridge. So here we are, the great suspension bridges of the United States, 1879, Scientific American. And so it shows four bridges. The first one is a Roebling bridge. The second one is a Roebling bridge. The third one is a Roebling bridge. I think you see a pattern here. And the fourth one is a Roebling bridge. So he was clearly the man. Now here we are, Niagara Bridge, 1851 to 55. He had built some aqueducts before this for canals, but this is a photograph of the bridge spanning the gorge of the Niagara. And here we see a stereoscopic view or stereo view showing these side-by-side -side images. And the images are slightly different. If you look at this building here, you can see that a little bit less of it is shown there. The idea was that you had two images that, so we, glass is not yet. Be patient, we'll get to that. So uh, side by side images and you needed a viewer with lenses to be able to see this. But with these stereo views, you could follow the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. You could travel to Paris or Egypt. You could travel around the world. And so this was like the home entertainment center of the Victorian parlor. And so now we can play with the glasses. 
So what you want to do is, first of all, you want to make sure that the red lens is over your left eye. And so if you've already folded the glasses, you have to refold them to do that. And you should be able to kind of move your eyes a little bit back and forth. This is an anaglyph, which is made from a software program scanning the original stereo view and then putting it together like this. And so you see this in three dimensions. Uh, and there are 44 images, I believe, in 3D in the book. So it gives you an opportunity to experience it as people seeing the bridge being built would have. Okay, so here's another one of the bridge. You see the American Falls here, the Canadian Falls there in the distance. And you can see that this is a two-tiered bridge, which was very unusual, was uh, very pioneering. So on the top, you had a steam engine that pulled railroad cars at five miles an hour across. And on the bottom, pedestrians and carriages could go. Uh, Mark Twain was not a fan of this. He said between the idea of the train collapsing down on top of you or the entire bridge falling into the gorge, uh, he would not be traveling it very much. So here we are back in Pennsylvania, the Allegheny Bridge in Pittsburgh. And so each of these, as he is going, he is perfecting John Roebling, his technique. He's refining what he's doing. And so this is actually iron towers. He will get to stone in Brooklyn. So here we are, Cincinnati Covington Bridge took 10 years to build because of the intercession of the Civil War. Uh, this is now known as the Roebling Bridge. And here is a Curry and Ives print, both of whom are interred at Greenwood Cemetery, of course. And uh, this shows you what a suspension bridge is. So in terms of understanding what's going on here, you see the towers, which John Roebling chose to make of stone in Brooklyn. And the towers, the point of the towers is to allow this to remain as a navigable waterway. And so the Brooklyn Navy Yard is just up in here and you needed to be able to get ships through there. So this allows the deck of the bridge to be high enough. And then the key is the cables, the cable wires of steel, the first time steel was used for cables. And then you have suspenders. So those are wires which come straight down from which you hang the steel beams of the deck of the bridge. And then these angled wires are to give the bridge more rigidity. John Roebling really pioneered the idea that a bridge had to be stiff. And so if you've ever seen the Galloping Gertie videos, the idea, the problem that they had with that bridge, which was a modern bridge, is that it was not sufficiently stiff. It started to rhythmically rock and collapsed, which was not a good thing. So here we are, John Roebling, as early as 1857. He's planning a bridge across the East River up around 59th Street, uh, Roosevelt Island in Manhattan. And here's the ferry that's being replaced. So this is the Fulton Ferry. This is the Brooklyn side. You see two ferry slips. You see the tower of the bridge. And this is where they were surveying that day in June of 1869. John Roebling saw a ferry coming into the slip. He jumped up on the wooden piles there, thinking he was out of the way. And the ferry crushed his foot between those piles and the ferry. And he then was taken to a doctor who wanted to amputate his toes. And John Roebling supervised the amputation without anesthetic. And then he told the doctors they didn't know what they were doing. He was going to use a water treatment to cure what ailed him. And he died a very painful death of lockjaw just a few weeks after that, leaving his 32-year-old son as the engineer in waiting and now the chief engineer. So this shows you the type of spot that John Roebling's foot 
would have uh, wound up in. And here is his grave in Trenton. And here is his son who, as I said, built the bridge. He monitored the construction of the bridge from Brooklyn Heights. And so he could see, this is a little artistic license. He apparently had a telescope and not binoculars, but he would watch what was going on and then basically send Emily out to explain to the assistant engineers what was going on and what had to be done. And she even reached the point where she was meeting with contractors to explain to them what had to be done in terms of new parts of the bridge that were being built. So here, just wonderful photographs, 1872, no Washington Roebling in this because as I said, he never was on the bridge as it was being built, but this is keyed. And so we know individuals here, uh, the general superintendent, uh, William Kingsley, et cetera, uh, the master mechanic here, Farrington. So just some wonderful details in the photographs. And here, 1878, as the work was progressing, as the cables were being spun, uh, trustees, draftsmen, and assistant engineers. And then we see up close two of my favorite assistant engineers. So this is William Payne who had served in the Civil War with Washington Roebling, they would change out of their uniforms and go scouting in Virginia, risking being shot on the spot as spies because they were in civilian clothes and making maps of what they saw to help the Union cause. And this is George McNulty. McNulty was an assistant engineer, graduate of the University of Virginia who came to Brooklyn and said, I'd like to work on the bridge. And they said, well, what kind of experience do you have? And he said, I just graduated from college. And they said, later for you. And then he said, I'll volunteer to work. And so Washington Roebling was so impressed, he hired him as an assistant engineer. One of the assistant engineers was hired on a 30-day contract. Every one of the six assistant engineers worked 14 years on the bridge. Not a single one left until the work was done. That's the loyalty that they had. And McNulty was so impressed by Washington Roebling that he named his son Washington McNulty. And so here are, of course, uh, as the historian at Greenwood Cemetery, I can't do a presentation without a gravestone. And so here we are, this is Payne's uh, gravestone. And here is McNulty's, we have an unmarked grave project. We actually bought land that had been a uh, memorial, a monument maker, and he left a lot of stones. And so we're recycling those stones. McNulty was in an unmarked grave and we put this out for him. So here are the workers uh, who built the bridge, many of whom were Civil War veterans, uh, many of whom were immigrants, Italian, Irish, German. Uh, the conditions were not always great on the bridge. The best estimate is that some 30 plus men died working on the bridge. But here you see their faces as the construction was underway. And here is a uh, photographer who knew what he was doing. So this is half of a stereo view. And the key to 3D effect is foreground, midground, and distance. And so if you'd like to put your glasses back on, with the red on the over your left eye once again. Uh, this one is pretty good. If you kind of rock from side to side, you can see it moving with you. So here we are uh, building the vaults for the approach, the brickwork. And here we are again in 3D. Okay, so we're back in 2D. The caissons were the very foundations of the bridge. Uh, there, uh, Washington and Emily had gone to Europe to study caissons where that work was being pioneered. Virtually nobody in America knew anything about caissons. And so by the time they came back, they were the American experts on caissons. And the idea was you built this 
huge wooden box out of 12 by 12 timbers. And you launched it and put it where you wanted the towers to be built. And then you started to put the stones of the towers on top of the caissons while the men worked inside the caisson and while you pumped compressed air into the caisson to keep the water of the East River from flooding the workspace and killing all the workers. And so here we are, of course, if you're gonna send this huge box, the largest box that had ever been sunk into the ground in the history of humankind, into the ground, you wanna know what you're gonna encounter. And so here we are, this is from the Municipal Archives of New York, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful drawing showing you, here's a detail of it and what they're gonna encounter as they go down 38 feet, 41 feet, 42 feet, boulders, sand and gravel. And so you had these different layers that were gonna present a challenge. And then the box itself was 168 feet long by 102 and you had six chambers and you want you needed to get all six chambers to bedrock as the foundation. So that was the challenge as you did this. So here we are, the uh, hired Webb and Bell who had a shipyard on the East River. They were building the biggest ships on the sea and they used ship building technology, including as you see here, launching it down the ways into the East River. Uh, one of Washington's Roebling's engineering competitors said, as soon as you launch this thing, it's gonna sink to the bottom of the East River. He begged to differ and it turned out he was right. So it floated across, here's Eckford Webb, the shipbuilder, a really extraordinary carving in granite, which is a tremendously hard material. Not a lot of memorial makers wanted to carve that, but here is the back of his monument and it says an eminent shipbuilder and constructor of the caissons for the first Brooklyn suspension bridge. So a man who had built the largest ships on the sea and his proudest accomplishment was the caissons of the Brooklyn Bridge. So here you see the caissons in action. They actually, Washington Roebling really refined this from what his father had laid out. And so this is kind of a water shaft from which they're pulling the debris that the men are loosening up through this water and then getting it up out. And so they needed the water to keep the compressed air in the chamber. And it was a balancing act for them because if you put too much water in here, you're gonna flood the caisson and kill all the workers. And if you don't have enough water in the column, it's gonna blow out and send fish and all sorts of things 300 feet into the air. So you had that, you had the lock from which the men came in to keep the air in there. And then you had the supply shafts. When you got the caisson to the level that you wanted, then you could bring in the brick and the concrete to fill the caisson. So these are actually underneath the towers of the Brooklyn Bridge as we speak today. So here is some of the wonderful drawings, just uh, wonderfully graphic designs of the caisson and a bit more refined here. And so you can actually see the tower up in here as it's going up. And here is a uh, photograph showing these, uh, you would have had compressors in here. So this is 1872. And you see there's a little bit of handwriting here. Uh, we can see the tower of the Brooklyn Bridge here. So that was the first tower that they were working on. So you can always orient yourself as you read through the book. Uh, the New York Tower was a little bit behind the Brooklyn Tower, but you also see some snow here. And so then we see the notations and Erica Wagner, as I said, expert on all things Washington Roebling, assures me that this is Washington Roebling's handwriting. And it says compressor house. So this is where those steam engines were that compressed the air that was then piped into the caissons and it says winter. And so that's confirmed by the snow that we see also. And so here we are the airlock. So there are some things, for instance, in the caisson 
there are no photographs that I have ever seen. And so we rely on woodcuts. So here we are, men breaking up boulders. Uh, the bridge is this extraordinary mix of the cutting edge, the use of steel, the first bridge to have electricity lighting the bridge in, the, in history going across a river, but at the same time, just extraordinarily primitive. So they're encountering boulders and they are using these hammers and chisels to break the boulders apart. And Washington Roebling becomes very frustrated because the work is just going very slowly. And so ever the uh, scientific experimenter, he takes a revolver down into the caisson and he fires a shot with just a little bit of black powder. And they kind of look around, you know, is anybody dead? Is the water flooding into the caisson? It looks like we're okay. And he just makes the charge bigger and bigger until he's satisfied that they can use black powder to blow these boulders apart. And so they start a night shift that's doing nothing but blowing up boulders. So here we are moving the debris. And then this is the pool into which they feed the debris and they have to keep it mixed. So these guys are assigned to keep water flowing in here and mix so that those steel teeth can grab onto the debris and pull it out of the caisson. So another drawing, this by John Roebling of the dredgers, and then they became more sophisticated. So again, the idea of sophisticated and not so sophisticated, you see the two clamshell buckets and he experimented with steel teeth and they were breaking all the time and he was getting very frustrated. But then you see this guy up here and what's he doing there? So. I consulted with an engineer who was expert in historic bridges. And he explained to me that this guy's only job was to wave to the guy who was operating the steam engine that lowered the bucket down when it was down sufficiently that it was at the pool. And so he would just go like that. And then they would know stop lowering. And then when it was ready, he would signal, bring it back up. So this is not a high level of sophistication, shall we say. So here you really see that uh, tooth bucket. They're filling this and then they're actually dumping the debris into the river and supposedly then dredging it all out. Here we are with the towers. So again, the towers are to get that deck high enough that you can keep the river navigable. Wonderful drawing by John Roebling. Uh, this, I think, was very much influenced by the idea of growing up in Mulhausen that had been surrounded by a stone wall for millennial, well, for centuries. And uh, so having seen that, uh, this and the Cincinnati Bridge are really the only bridges that have these tremendous stone entrances. And I think that's part of the appeal of the Brooklyn Bridge. It's really a grand entrance. If you've been to the Williamsburg Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge with their steel towers, it just doesn't have the same allure. And so here we are, a bit of a joke. I'm not sure John Roebling was completely behind this, but you see this woman with the parasol who's just been thrown into the drawing for perhaps for scale. So here we are, this is a drawing by Washington Roebling. So if you ever go across the bridge again, keep in mind that the towers are hollow, that they're not solid stone. These are voids in here and here. Uh, he just, as an engineer, calculated that they didn't need to make the towers solid and that they could save money and time. So th this is, uh, again, one of my many favorite photographs. Uh, this is clearly a photographer who had some pull with the bridge. So to be able to get the workers to pause in their work and to look at the camera. So you see the suits down here. And then you see these guys up here. And he, also the photographer was able to get them to hang these granite stones up there to increase the drama of the photograph. And notice that the Brooklyn Tower is peering over the Manhattan Tower there. So here we are, some skylines of Manhattan. Uh, we're looking, this is the city hall area. 
as it exists today. And this would be the South Street seaport area. And the tower really did tower over the skyline such as it was in Manhattan during the 1870s. And so here we have three beauty shots. So if you'd like to put your glasses back on, this is looking at the New York Tower with the old post office here. And then we have some barrels in here and one of the towers going up. And then a beautifully composed photograph from the Brooklyn side looking across to Manhattan. Okay, so we're back in 2D. Brooklyn from the Brooklyn Tower. Again, Brooklyn was known as the city of churches. So you see all these church steeples up here, but it was even lower than Manhattan in the 1870s. And then the anchorages. So you're gonna have these massive cables. They're gonna be 15 and a half inches across, 13,000 miles of wire contained in the four cables. And you are gonna have to kind of tie them down somewhere. And so they built these anchorages, which are still there, though very few people notice them. And these anchorages are just piles essentially of granite to hold the ends of the cables in place. And so here you see, this is the massive cast iron anchor plate. And then you connected anchor bars to the cables and the cables then went across the towers. So here we see the relationship of the anchorage to the towers. And so the cables are gonna come up here and then dip through here and then go back down there. So here are those anchor plates and here they are in 3D for you. And you can see, I think these are surveyors here, but these plates, you would, the strands of the cables, each cable was 19 strands. In Cincinnati, by comparison, I believe it was five strands per cable. So this is a much more massive undertaking here. Here are the anchor bars, and then we go to 3D on the anchor bars. So they're composing these, they're kind of surrounding them. Uh, the practice in Europe was to leave the anchor bars accessible so that you could maintain them. Washington Roebling, who obviously knew Europe pretty well having traveled there, said, Americans are an impatient people. They will not want to maintain my anchor bars. And so he just surrounded them with stone and called it a day. So here we are, one of the fascinating elements of the bridge, the footbridge and cables. This is the footbridge, uh, cradles, excuse me. And it allowed the workers to get out as they were spinning the cable. And we'll explain that in a few moments but they could watch to make sure that all of the wires were in the same tension as it was being spun. And so this was purely a temporary as they were working on the construction and then they took it down. Uh, this is a wonderful 3D image from the top of the Brooklyn Tower. And so this one, again, if you kind of rock from side to side, you should see that foreground moving with you. And so here, this is not OSHA approved. This is uh, what, what these cradles looked like with this guy just kind of wedging a board in there. And he was supposed to check each of the wires that went across. And then he has a flag in his right hand. So if the wire is too tight or too loose, he waves and then his comrades are gonna tighten it up or loosen it up depending on what's needed. And so this is, really uh, quite remarkable. This is a sign put up by Washington Roebling, uh, safe for only 25 men at a time. And he's concerned about uh, break step and don't walk together and all of that. But what's remarkable here, you don't see a, a security guard here, nor do you see a gate here. And so if you climbed up onto the anchorage, you were free in the early years of the bridge construction to walk across this walk. And so it became kind of crazy. Here we are in 3D with this. And so you see these anchor bars 
that are going to be used for the cable. This is what spins the cable, actually gets pulled from the Brooklyn side to the Manhattan side. So they're pulling the wires one wire at a time to make these cables. And here we are 3D looking down. This is the shed that they're keeping the wires in. And here we are again, you see the slats, these oak slats are separated so that it doesn't pick the wind up and really rock back and forth. And so this, with all due respect to Sinatra, regrets, I've had a few. Uh, you could go up there and walk across, and some people got up there and then realized they had made a mistake. And so E.F. Farrington, who was the master mechanic, said that, the grizzled master mechanic, I might add, uh, said that women seem to do a better job up there than the men did. So. I won't try to explain that, but so here we are, the cables. So the cables were the key to the bridge, key to the suspension bridge. This is Farrington demonstrating to his workers, many of whom had been sailors, that there was nothing to fear, that these cables, these wires were strong. And so he rode across and then had to hide. He had thought he was going to do this quietly. And the Brooklyn Daily Eagle found out about it and published Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, you can see Farrington be the first one to ride across the bridge. And so like 20,000 people came out and they wanted to carry him through the streets and he wasn't having any of that. So this is the basic idea. You're attaching a wire and just pulling it across and then coming back and pulling another wire across. That's how they made the cables. Uh, the original cables are still there. You could use this very same technique to replace the cables if that's ever necessary on the Brooklyn Bridge. So here we are, the carrier wheel. You can see they wrapped the wire around and that's how they pulled it back and forth. The Brooklyn Historical Society or what used to be the Brooklyn Historical Society has one of these. And just, uh, I think a wonderful drawing. Each wire was 800 feet long. If you're doing 13,000 miles, that's a lot of splices. And so Washington Roebling came up with this splicing machine, but just how graphic the drawing of this is. So here are the workers, the wire shed is up there. And we're looking down again in two dimensions towards where that shed was. And here you see kind of a cutaway. Uh, each of the four cables had two huge uh, spools of wire assigned to it, and here's how they connected. So these are the anchor bars going down into the anchorage, and these are the strands of the cables, and they're connecting one to the other. Here's Washington Roebling, 1869, very early in the construction of the bridge, and he's kind of musing about how are we gonna put all these strands together. And so if we look at the detail here, this is probably 10 years before he really had to worry about this, but you can see he's changed the numbers. So strand number 12 is gonna go here, 13 here, 14 here. Oh no, let's put 14 over here. And so he's kind of just playing with that. Here we are, this is a lantern slide from my collection. Uh, in the early days of eBay, a Tennessee uh, TV repair shop advertised lantern slides of the Brooklyn Bridge. And I took a flyer on it and wound up with some images that don't exist anywhere else in the world. And so this is one of those images and you can see the four cables here. One, two, three, four. And what's remarkable here is you can see that this cable and this cable have been tied down. You see those brackets that have the strands one against another. And yet these, that process has not yet occurred. You also see up here, this was a temporary railroad that they constructed out of wood just to move material around, construction material. And so we'll see some photographs of that. This is the top of the tower showing the, one of the cables as it was being bracketed. And here it is in 3D.
So that's a pretty strong and unusual image also. And then here we are wrapping the cables. So Washington Roebling came up with the idea, we're gonna take galvanized zinc and wrap the cables to protect the steel from the salt water. And that has done a tremendous job uh, as he planned. So here we are, and now we're constructing the deck of the bridge. You can see it's separated into sections. Here is one of those cars that is moving materials along that wooden railway. Uh, just a wonderful drawing by one of the particularly talented assistant engineers in terms of the approach. You had to be able to get people, horses onto the bridge. And that meant that the bridge was gonna be over a mile long because it had to be gradual. If it was raining and the horses couldn't climb because it was slippery, that was gonna not help your bridge function. And so here we are in 3D. This is the approach, which runs from the anchorage down to the roads connecting the bridge. And here we are, you see that car up again here, and they are moving stones into position. Here's a close up. And here is, you see, with a payload here as they're moving materials around. So the suspended superstructure or the deck of the bridge, that is the steel beams here. You just, as an aside, see these guys kind of casually hanging around about 200, 300 feet in the air, nothing to worry about. And here you see they came out evenly from each of the sides, trying to keep the stress on the towers even. And here we are connecting the suspender wires, which are connected up above to the cables and down below to the steel beams. John Roebling was very proud that the bridge was gonna be 80 feet wide, as wide as Broadway and Manhattan. And when they had to adjust it because the federal government kind of stepped in and said, you gotta raise the bridge higher, they expanded it so now it's 85 feet wide. And here are the sections. And so you had traffic going in two lanes on the outside. Then you were gonna have a railway going from one end of the bridge to the other. And then you were gonna have what I think is one of the great elements of the bridge, an element that has never been repeated on any bridge since, the elevated pedestrian bridge uh, path. And so this was to allow people to get a view of New York Harbor. You can see the Statue of Liberty from up there. Uh, it was also for what they called invalids to get fresh air into their lungs in the 19th century. And so here we see uh, an artist with something of uh, artistic license, kind of messing this up and only making one lane. But the railway and terminal, as I said, they wanted to get this going. It didn't open when the bridge opened, but uh, several months later, it did open and they ran a cable car. And so William Payne, our friend who served with Washington Roebling in the Civil War, he was the man of cable cars in America. He had worked in San Francisco, he would work in Cleveland and Denver on cable cars. And so they had this huge steam engine on the Brooklyn side that drove the cable. And these were the terminals, the terminal at each end. And this is one of the drawings for the terminal. And then you see that piece right up in here. So it was five cents for five minutes to get across the bridge and became tremendously popular. Uh, this is the interior of the Brooklyn terminal. And then we have, let's see if we can do this. I think my pointer is not uh, cooperating. All right, so this is a movie from 1899, which you can find on the uh, internet. And it shows the cars. The bridge is kind of remarkable because it evolves over time transportation wise. 
And so originally there have two lanes for carriages, for cows to go across, for sheep, for pigs. Uh, but by 1899, they've added a trolley in each direction, in addition to the cable cars that are going across. Oh, there we go. So you see right here, the cable is right in there. And so in terms of the evolution of the bridge, we see here, this is from September of last year. Uh, I went on the bridge for a walk in May of last year, and it was something of a horror show because the bicycles were up there with the pedestrians. And you had to look over your shoulder every time you wanted to kind of edge to the right. And so New York City, in its wisdom, has now created a separate bicycle lane and taken the bicycles away from the uh, the area. So now we're up to the opening day, May 24th, 1883, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people come into New York City. Uh, the president of the United States, Chester A. Arthur, a New Yorker, is there. Uh, he is greeted by the mayor of Brooklyn and fl the fleet in the harbor salutes in celebration. A union of hearts, a union of hands, the two cities joined and great fireworks, which were repeated, the Grucci family in 1983. And I was there for that, which was thrilling. Uh, the bridge is still an icon in New York City. And so if you're gonna advertise the two not very good basketball teams in New York, uh, the Knicks and the Nets, you put the Brooklyn Bridge behind them. And here is the bridge in all its glory. And here is the book again. And so I just wanted to read, I'm very proud, Kurt Anderson, the host of uh, Studio 360 on NPR, Peabody award-winning author. If you love Brooklyn or bridges or New York City or cities or 19th century marvels or all of the above as I do, building the Brooklyn Bridge is a perfect feast, a would-be time traveler's delight, overflowing with rare and evocative and fascinating images. It's a terrific book. And then finally, Montgomery Schuyler, The Day the Bridge Opened in Harper's Weekly. It so happens that the work which is likely to be our most durable monument and to convey some knowledge of us to the most remote posterity is a work of bare utility, not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. Thank you. Now, there are some times when you don't mind telling a speaker it's time to stop. I could have kept going for hours. That was just absolutely fascinating. So Richard, thank you very much. All right, so we do, oops, sure. So we have Q&A, we have. <laughs> All right, so here we have our first question. Thank you. How much did it cost to build and how is it financed? Uh, it was originally estimated at $5 million. It cost slightly over $15 million. And it was actually financed. It was a joint stock company that was chartered by the New York State Legislature. And so you could buy stock in the bridge. And the allure of the stock was that it, the bridge would pay for itself with the charges to get across the bridge. So actually originally they were charging a penny to walk across the bridge and that ended, but they continued to charge other ways and quickly paid for itself. All right. Oh, here we go. This is Moran. How is the bridge maintained today here in Philadelphia? There's constant uh, maintaining of our bridges. So is it maintained? It is, it is maintained, yes, very much so. Uh, McCullough in his book talks about the Brooklyn Bridge and he said that he interviewed people from the Department of Public Works in Manhattan. And they said of all the bridges on the East River, the Brooklyn Bridge gave them the least trouble. 
In the 1940s, a study of the Brooklyn Bridge was done. What do we have to do to fix it up? They took two years and certainly, I'm sure, a good amount of money to study the bridge. And the recommendation was that it needed a new coat of paint. <laughs> and so that was about it. Uh, the towers themselves have been cleaned and, it, and I believe rejointed uh, just in the last few months. So there is a constant maintenance of the bridge, but uh, I think in very good shape. Jim, I have one in the back here. Got it. So is there anyone still in the caissons? <laughs> <laughs> not, not that we know of. It's the first time I've heard that question. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if you knew the author, the person who's asked it, you'd understand. Oh, That's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question for you. Um, why is it not the New York Bridge, but the Brooklyn Bridge? And why didn't um, he name it after himself? Or was that not in vogue? Uh, it was not in vogue. The bridge uh, was referred to by a number of names. And so it was the New York and Brooklyn Bridge. It was the East River Bridge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the uh, leaders, the civic leaders of Brooklyn were the primary movers behind the bridge. And so they were a much stronger force than the New York people and Boss Tweed and the corruption that was associated with the bridge and so I think the fact that Brooklyn had really pushed for it is probably the reason that it became known as the Brooklyn Bridge. Okay. So um, speaking, following up on the case on people, uh, if it's an unmarked grave, how do you figure out who's in it? Uh, I don't <laughs> think the bodies actually were left in the case on. I think they were all reclaimed. And so uh, I don't know that there are any bodies there. Just in general, at the cemetery. Yeah, the cemetery is what I was really referring to. Sorry, it's oh, tangential question. Oh, the question. cemetery does have bodies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unmarked graves, the cemetery has a very, very extensive mapping system that dates to its earliest days. And so that mapping system will give us a detail of 220 or so sections over the 478 acres in the cemetery. And then each of those sections has a detailed map with every lot there drawn. And so with McNulty, there might be eight people in that lot. And so we know who's in that lot. And then I can see the adjoining lots and see gravestones that match those adjoining lots and then figure out exactly where the multi lot is. Okay, we'll, we'll do one last question because we still have books for sale if anybody hasn't bought a book yet after you've seen that, that, that great program. All right. Hi, since the Williamsburg Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge all look like uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, did they follow the same drawings or anything? Did they copy the bridge? No, no, they did not. Some of the, actually the sons of some of the engineers who worked on the Brooklyn Bridge then worked on the Manhattan and the Williamsburg Bridge. But they were, uh, to my mind, they don't look that much alike. I much prefer the look of the Brooklyn Bridge. All right, now this will be the real last question. All right. Were there any members of the Roebling family that later on went on to either build bridges or work in the family business? Because I know in New Jersey, there's a Roebling, New Jersey and Trenton and the like, and it looked like it was a thriving industry at one point in time. Yes, it was very much of a family business. Uh, Washington Roebling, who was just totally debilitated by his work on the bridge, survived all of the others who had worked on the bridge. He died in 1926. By the 19-teens, the Roeblings had pretty much been exhausted. His brothers, his nephews were gone. And he was brought back to run the Roebling wire operation and continued until he was 86 years old, 
running that operation. So just truly remarkable. Interesting. All right, just a little, little bit of Union League trivia then. Uh, in the first class of women members admitted at the board meeting in August of, geez, 1986, one of them was Mary Roebling. She, she was not a Roebling by birth. She had married into the family, but nonetheless, though, she was married and she was a banker by profession, though. So not involved in that. So Richard, thank you so very, very much for a fantastic program. Thank you. All right. So everybody, your goal is two things. Walk across the Brooklyn Bridge and then go visit Greenwood Cemetery. So thank you all for being here tonight, folks. We appreciate it. There will be books for sale in the back of the room shortly. Next program, June the 8th, Liberty Series, Greg Lukayanov, free speech on college campuses. Should be pretty good. Thank you all for being here this evening, everybody, and have a good Memorial Day holiday. Thank you.